Good morning. Welcome to Hope Church at Silver Lake. It is July 12th. My goodness, we're already almost halfway through the month of July. Tonight, or today we are beginning, today we're beginning a new sermon series um, by faith, by faith. We're going to be looking at Old Testament texts that are referred to in Hebrews chapter 11. Our call to worship is related to our text for today um, in the reality that God is our salvation. Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple, by awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation. The hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, the one who by his strength established the mountains, be girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the tumult of the waves, and the roaring of the people so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe of your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty, your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. The pastures of the wilderness overflow, the hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks, the valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise you for this day. We thank you for this, another opportunity to gather together, Lord God, in worship of you. You are our God. You are our salvation. We thank and praise you for Jesus Christ, who lived obediently to your will, who offered himself as a sacrifice for the atonement of sin, who was raised again to life, Lord God, in victory over sin and Satan and death. We praise you, God, for your Holy Spirit who confirms your word in our hearts, who guides us in righteousness and in truth. We thank you that even today, Lord God, as we have gathered here, you are with us whether we're here or whether we're in our homes or we're somewhere in our cars. Lord God, you are with us, and God, it's your desire for us to know you, to trust you, to rest, God, in your faithfulness. We praise you, God, that your promises are true. We thank you, Lord God, that you are faithful, to take care of us, to provide for us. Even today, God, for those who are struggling, for those who are sick, for those who are dealing with great uncertainty, we thank you, God, for the hope that is ours. We pray, God, for your comfort and peace for those who are hospitalized. We pray, Lord God, that you'd continue to be with Scarlett. We thank you that she is doing well, and, um, but we, lo- we look forward, God, to her being able to come home We praise you, God, uh, for Tyler and Kelly, who are now husband and wife. And we pray, Lord God, that you would bless them as they begin their lives together as, uh, as, as, 
as the Summers family. And even today, Lord God, we want to pray for Dan Venberg, who is our new director of international missions. And we just thank you for his history in serving you in Ch Chad, Africa, and Cameroon. And, and um, just thank you, God, that uh, he is a great resource to our, our missionaries. And we just pray that you would bless him and Rachel and their family in this new calling. And, and uh, today we thank you, God, that Dean Bengston, our missionary in Japan, is soon to be released from physical therapy as he's recovering now from his stroke and as he and Linda resume their lives and their work together as missionaries in Japan. We just pray, God, for strength and continued healing on Dean's behalf. In all these things, God, we praise you for your goodness and we ask, Lord God, that you would just fill our hearts again today with joy as we worship you. Thank you, God, for being our God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hello and good morning, Hope Church friends and family. I hope you're doing wonderful. Thanks for joining our virtual service today, and um, I just pray that the week has gone really well for you, and um, you're at a time where you can just uh, relax, uh, worship, and um, spend some time with Jesus. So uh, let's get into a song, or a time of uh, worship and song. <laughs> Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest rain, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking when darkness seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus 
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. This last song we're going to uh, sing this morning is a new one. It's called Surrounded, Fight My Battles. And um, it's a song I've personally been super encouraged by, and the Lord has done a good work in my heart through it. And um, the theme of the song is really just as we encounter battles or trials in our life, um, what means do we have as believers, as Christians, to come up against these battles on our own? Um, and the answer is, <laughs> we're going to fall short. We're going to lose these battles as the enemy comes to us with things that make us struggle and make us think and cause us to doubt. So as we sing these words, we, we're going to um, say things such as, my weapons are praise and thanksgiving. <laughs> and that really just shows that we're going to lean into Jesus as we come across these battles and as these trials come against us. We can go to the throne of God in prayer and say, Lord, I need you, I need your strength, and I need your grace to help me through these trials, through my battles. And then we're going to sing as well that my victories in Jesus' name. It's going to be a sweet thing to just proclaim together. So I encourage you to follow along and um, sing with me from where you're at as you pick it up.
There's a table that you've prepared for me in the presence of the enemies. It's your body and your blood you shed for me. This is how I fight my battles. There's a table that you've prepared for me in the presence of my enemies. It's your body and your blood you shed for me. This is how I fight my battles. And I believe you've overcome and I will lift my song of praise for all you've done this is how I fight my battles this is how I fight my battles this is how I fight my battles this is how this is how I fight my battles this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. In the valley, I know that you're with me. And surely your goodness and your mercy follow me. So my weapons are praise and thanksgiving. This is how I fight my battles. And I believe you've overcome. And I will lift my song of praise for all you've done. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. My victories in Jesus' name. 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 This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how, this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. Thank you, God, that uh, we can fight our battles by pressing into you, by turning to you, by releasing our cares and our burdens and our worries to you. Thank you, thank you, Lord, that it's your promise to be with us um, and fight alongside us, God. 
thank you, Lord, that there's no obstacle too big for, um, for you to conquer on our behalf in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy that will follow us just all the days of our life. May we put our trust in you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Kito and Katura. What a blessing. Good morning, Hope Church family, and welcome to our July 12th service. Whether you're sitting in your living room in your favorite easy chair enjoying this online on YouTube or Facebook, or perhaps you are a member of our very first drive-in congregation sitting out in the parking lot right now, welcome. Last Monday, we were down in Olympia at a park visiting with our grandson. And I saw kids running, I saw kids splashing in a lake, I even saw a couple of kids turning somersaults. And I remember looking and saying, I used to do that. There was a day where being flipped upside down and landing on your feet had some attraction, but uh, not now. The idea of wobbling around just doesn't do it for me anymore. But you know, each one of us as Christians have time in our lives where we are turned upside down. Our lives are just somersaulted around where we struggle for a place to begin, and we ask the question, what should I do? And some of us respond in ways we're proud of, and some of us respond in ways that we know we could do better. But I'm reminded of a, a favorite hymn I have, one that we don't sing too often anymore. It's an old hymn. But the story behind the words is incredible, and I want to tell you that story right now. There was a lawyer who lived in Chicago named Horatio Spafford, and he built up his law practice and was quite successful. In fact, he was successful enough that he began to invest in properties in Chicago. In fact, he was quoted telling one of his friends that he felt like he was sitting on top of the world. And then as the song tells us, one day, Old Lady Leary's cow kicked over a lantern and started the Great Chicago Fire. And Horatio Spafford lost everything in the span of a day and a half. All of his real estate investments were burnt. In fact, he told a friend that all he had left was his university diploma. And he and his family struggled to put their lives back together again. But not only was Horatio a successful lawyer, he was also an elder of his church. And as the family struggled to get back together again, Horatio decided it would be a good idea to get away on a little family vacation. And who hasn't thought about that? So, in the late 1800s, what did you do but booked steamship passage for he and his family to Europe. And about a week before they left, business called him away. And he realized he would not be traveling with his family, but he would be coming a week or two later. So he put them on a steamship and sent them across the Atlantic. And about halfway across, about a week into the voyage, the passage of the steamship was intersected with another iron ship, and they collided at about three in the morning. And the steamship was cut nearly in half, and it took 12 minutes for it to go down. And in fact, the steamship had just been renovated, and they found later that the paint they'd put on the lifeboats had actually glued the lifeboats to the deck. And 226 people were lost. Horatio Spafford's wife, Anna, was found floating on a piece of wreckage, unconscious, and was taken aboard a boat and shipped to England. And the first word that Horatio got was a six-word telegram sent from his wife in England, and it read, saved alone, what shall I do? And that is a question we all ask when troubles hit us. What shall I do? But Horatio Spafford is a Christian, recognized, as Kido reminded us here in this last song, the opportunity we have to lean on God. So he booked steamship passage, and it was a famous collision, a famous sinking, so the captain knew of him. And the captain knocked on his cabin door one evening and said, according to my best calculations, this is roughly the spot 
where you lost your daughters. And Horatio had been wondering, what would he feel? Would he be overcome with grief? But he was shocked to recognize that he was overcome by peace. By peace that God had given him, that peace that passes all understanding. And he was motivated to go down to his cabin and begin working on a poem that later became the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And part of that hymn says, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. So, for us, whether it's loss of work, family problems, maybe even a pandemic that's turned your world upside down, when we ask, what shall we do? It is my hope and prayer for myself as well as you that we answer, trust in God to lead us and to guide us. Last night I emailed out our hope prayer notes, our hope calendars, as well as our weekly Bible reading schedule. Please check your inboxes, that should be there. Uh, last week I also emailed out an invitation to join us in our parking lot congregation. So if you have any questions, certainly give the office a call, but I think it's fairly self-explanatory. We will be continuing to do that. I'm also excited to tell you that either Wednesday, March, or excuse me, uh, July 22nd or Sunday, July 26th, we will be having drive-in communion services. You'll be getting some information via email next Tuesday on that as well, so take a look for that. In the meantime, I encourage you to continue to look to our Hope Church website, hopechurch.cc. In particular, our Church at Home page, where you'll find our family devotion time. Last week, we spoke about courage, and this week, our topic is mercy. Our weekly Bible reading schedule is there as well. Our online sermon library, as well as our Hope Giving page. Our Right Now Media Christian Library page is there. The online directory, and our Hope Prayer Request page as well. And every week, I get to thank you for supporting the work that we do here on behalf of God and through God's power at Hope Church that reaches across this city as well as across this globe. So thank you for your continued support for, uh, for that as well. Today I'm going to read from Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. And this is Paul writing to the church in Philippi. And it's not a church that has troubles, it's a church that has supported him materially on his travels around the Mediterranean. So he writes this as a letter of encouragement to them. Here's what Philippians 4, 4 through 9 says. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything, but instead pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you have learned and received from me everything you have heard from me and saw me doing, then God's peace will be with you. Amen. Good morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. On this 12th day of July 2020, we start a sermon series by faith. Comes out of Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 
Faith is a very real part of our life as Christians. And in the previous chapter, the author to the book of Hebrews says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. As our circumstances continue to be challenged in dealing with this virus and this pandemic, I know I'm almost throwing up every time I say that word now, but, but it's unfortunate that it has had such a tremendous impact in our routines and in our homes and in our businesses. Um, you know, we didn't, weren't able to have Bible camp this year. Uh, tomorrow would have been our first day of vacation Bible school, and those who know me know how excited I get about vacation Bible school, and not having vacation Bible school. This is the first year in 25 years that we at Hope haven't had a vacation Bible school that I've participated in. That's crazy. And even now as we start thinking about what fall might look like, and I know this is still early, but have you noticed there aren't any back to school ads yet on TV? Yeah, this pandemic has really messed us up. But it's not just us. I mean, it's the whole world. We can't say that we've got it worse than anybody else. And this is what's amazing about our text that we're looking at here by faith. we're going to see that the examples of faithful people come from the Old Testament, from the book of Genesis and Exodus. That's where we're going to be spending our time. But the context is, is wrapped up in this verse from Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and these are the witnesses that we're going to be talking about in these next weeks. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So this is the context of these stories from the Old Testament. By faith. By faith. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that, that these Old Testament references of faith will encourage us in our faith. Lord God, we live in difficult times. We thank you, God, that you're a God who sustains us, a God who heals us, a God who helps us, a God who gives us victory. You fight our battles, Lord God. You, you give us, Lord God, uh, and you give us and you give us more. Um, just as we heard from Warren, Lord God, your peace, it surpasses all understanding. And we pray that even now, God, that we can run this race, we can fight in these battles, we can look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And Lord God, be at rest. Be filled, Lord God, with your hope. We pray, Lord God, that you'd bless um, our, our considerations today as we look at this passage from Genesis 4. We thank you for this passage and give us understanding in your truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis 4. Context, obviously, of Genesis 
Creation. Creation. God creating the heavens and the earth. God creating all the animals, all the lands and the flowers and the trees. And then God creates Adam and Eve, and they live in this incredible harmony in the Garden of Eden. And then along comes the crafty serpent. Did God really say you'd die? Look at that fruit. That fruit is just so incredibly delicious. God didn't really say you'd die. He just doesn't want you to be like him. Here, try it. Eve takes a bite, and then she gives a bite to Adam, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the perfect relationship between God and man is broken. God comes, and he looks for Adam. He looks for Eve. And he makes this incredible promise that there is one who will come from her seed, from their own loins, so to speak. There is one who will come that will crush, crush the serpent's head, even though the serpent will bruise his heel. And then we get to chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain, a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. This is one of those stories that have always oh, just perplexed me. To be honest, it's the first time I've ever preached on this story of Cain and Abel. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy of life outside the Garden of Eden. And this is a most incredible, heinous crime as Cain kills his brother Abel. If we were to read farther into this text, we didn't read it as a part of our, of our sermon prep here for today. We know that Cain did lay in wait for his brother Abel and, and kill him. God came to Cain and said, where is your brother? And that famous line, am I my brother's keeper? In this tragedy of where is Abel, there's an incredible story of relationship. Adam and Eve, just as God promised, were blessed with Cain and Abel, and there were other children that would come. But this, this truly, from a biblical standpoint, is the first family Mom, dad, kids. And not only is there this incredible relationship with mom and dad and kids, but mom and dad and kids enjoy this incredible relationship with God, their creator. 
And yet in this life and in this relationship with God who loves and cares and provides and interacts with his creation, there's this incredible history of the reality of sin. Not only the stress it creates in relationship, but the tragedy of one brother killing another. This story of where is Abel is a story of individuals. Interesting. Cain and Abel were brothers. The first brothers. Adam and Eve could give them all the attention they could handle. It's always amazing to me. As I've read this, one Cain was a worker of the ground. Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Here again, the uniqueness of God's creation, the uniqueness of how God puts us together within our mother's womb, the uniqueness of how God just makes us unique and different, even though we have the same parents. This has been evidenced to my wife and I in in, in, in being grandparents, Lucy, Leo, and Hank, Jeff and Kelsey's kids, they got the same parents. They grow up in the same house. They eat the same foods. At least sometimes they eat the same foods. They're kind of picky eaters once in a while. But at any rate, they're so different. Even though Lucy's only six and Hank is only three and Leo's right in between them, it's, it's just amazing how different they can be. We know they have the same mom. They have the same dad. They're in the same family. And we're just going to be amazed to see what they become as they grow up. But that's just the blessing of God and his power and his creative ability. Even though he uses the same mom and the same dad, blessed with such unique blessings. And Cain, his job as a keeper of the ground, wasn't any more honorable or less honorable than Abel being a keeper of the sheep. They were just doing what they were supposed to do in the creative order of God giving man dominion over the land and over the animals. This is an incredible story of just the uniqueness of who we are as individuals. And yet, We're all dependent upon God. Life is a gift. God is the one who sustains. God is the one who keeps. God is the one who provides. And we read that in Psalm 65 today. Thirdly today, where is Abel? This is a story about the condition of the heart. The author of the book of Hebrews writes in chapter 11, we know it as verse 4, by faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. Our story in Genesis details Cain. Cain brought an offering of fruit from the ground. Abel's offering was of the firstborn of the flock and of their fat portions. There isn't any record in Genesis prior to this of God requesting offerings, but we have this reality that offerings were brought to God, both by Cain and by Abel. There isn't any detail as to why God regarded Abel's offering, but did not regard Cain's offering. 
They were both offerings. They were both gifts to God. They were both in recognition, so to speak, of God's blessing. But it is noted that God regarded Abel's, but he did not have regard for Cain's. It is very clearly noted how Cain responded. Cain was very angry, and it says his face fell. Cain's anger with God and his envy of his brother is very clear, and God comes to Cain and says, why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? Here again, God in his mercy and grace was not just rejecting Cain, it's just that he didn't have regard for his offering. And there again, there's great mystery as to the why of that. God says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? There again, just as Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God came to them and offered them grace and forgiveness. Here again, God's desire for Cain is not that he would be angry, not that his face would be fallen, but he comes and he says, to Cain. Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you. But you must rule over it. Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you. But you must rule over it. Just as Satan tempted Adam and Eve, Satan was at work in Cain's heart. And rather than seeking God's mercy, seeking God's direction, Cain lashes out and takes his brother's life. Paul writes in Romans, let not sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. The battle that we face isn't a virus. The battle we face is sin. Satan and death. And Jesus Christ has given us the victory. Even in the Old Testament, the prophet Habakkuk, he said, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. Habakkuk wasn't necessarily speaking of Cain, but he's speaking of the person who is prideful and selfish, the one who is trusting in his own merit and goodness, thinking this is something I deserve, something I've earned. But Habakkuk declares in his prophecy, the righteous shall live by faith. The one who lives by faith humbly receives and believes God's promise, knowing it is a gift, knowing it isn't what we deserve, but it's God's blessing for us, enabling us to live confidently and contently in peace and joy as we believe in God's promises to us. Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, 
but you in God's promise can rule over it. May God's victory through Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord, give you victory to rule over it. It is God's promise to bless you and keep you, to make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord God is with you and even today is giving you his peace. Amen.